During the 90s, if there was one sitcom that got everyone tuned into it and talking about it, that was Seinfeld. The comedy series which was notoriously known as the show about nothing. Which, don't be fooled, that was part of the show's comedic appeal. But, in actual fact, the show was actually about lots of things. From 1989 to 1998, Seinfeld was a comedy series which was semi-autobiographically about its main star, Jerry Seinfeld, where the show's format would show Jerry in a stand-up comedy set to an audience, as well as day-to-day footage of him interacting with his fellow characters, his best friend George, crazy neighbor Kramer, and ex-girlfriend Elaine, where we would see their mundane New York lives, which were actually really anything but mundane, in which many classic TV moments were created, making Seinfeld without a doubt one of the most celebrated TV shows of all time. So let's not waste any time and just skip all the BS as we go straight into 10 things that you didn't know about Seinfeld. Otherwise, I am going to call the cops. Let's check it out. Number 10. Seinfeld originally intended to be a one-off 90-minute TV special. In the late 80s, comedian Jerry Seinfeld was an uprising stand-up comedian. One who was guaranteed plenty of chuckles from his audience. I mean, look at him here rocking the mullet. Yep, it was all work at the front and party at the back with plenty of humour. Seinfeld's manager had suggested to NBC that Jerry do some writing for the station. And thankfully NBC were keen, and offered Seinfeld the opportunity to work on a project for the network in November 1988. And thankfully, Jerry was also keen, and approached fellow comedian and friend Larry David, as in the Curb Your Enthusiasm guy, to help him create a comedy special. The pitch of the show was basically how a comedian gets his material, with the show focusing on Jerry doing a stand-up set mixed in with footage from his otherwise mundane day-to-day life. So we go into NBC, we tell them I got an idea for a show about nothing. Exactly. They say, what's your show about? I say nothing. There you go. I think you may have something here. (laughs) It was originally intended to be a one-off 90-minute special to fill in a slot from Saturday Night Live, and it was to be called Stand Up. However, Seinfeld and David felt that the idea that they were working on had too much potential to be confined to a mere one-off special. So instead, they focused on making this script that they had been working on as a pilot episode for a comedy series. So, yeah, Seinfeld could have been a one-and-done deal. Number 9. The show nearly finished as soon as it started. So NBC got behind making the Seinfeld pilot, with it also being produced by Castle Rock Films, which was a production company created by director Rob Reiner, as in the guy who directed Stand By Me and Misery. So it's here we get to the first Seinfeld episode, in which the show was called The Seinfeld Chronicles, in what honestly feels like an early prototype of what's to come. There were several standout differences. Elaine was nowhere to be seen, Kramer was called Kessler, and had small hair, whereas George, well, he had hair. Wow. The pilot was filmed and then shown to NBC executives, and, well, they just didn't seem to find it very funny. Yep, they had no faith in it whatsoever. So the pilot was then shown to a test audience, who also really didn't find it funny, with feedback of the episode including words like, weak, along with questions like, quote, why are they interrupting the stand-up for these stupid stories? Yeah, ouch. Yeah, look, it wasn't exactly love at first sight. So, it'll seem that this proposed semi-autobiographical stand-up show about Jerry Seinfeld was dead and buried. Except it wasn't. Number 8. Surprise viewership led to four more episodes. 
So after the initial negative reception of the Seinfeld Chronicles, Castle Rock, who produced the special, decided to focus on another TV pilot for a sitcom that it had produced at the same time as the Seinfeld pilot called Angelian. Now, the Angelian show fared up better with the NBC executives, along with test audiences. And so Castle Rock felt that this was the right direction to go in, and that this is the show that the company should focus on. Except when a full season was greenlit, and filmed, and aired, it didn't really take off as anticipated. And so the Angelian show never made it past its first 13 episodes. However, when the Seinfeld Chronicles was broadcast, that did pique interest in viewership, to pretty much the surprise of everyone. And despite there being no further Seinfeld episodes on the horizon, there was something of a demand for more Seinfeld from fans of the pilot episode. And even critics who loved the show wanted to know why there wasn't a subsequent series. So clearly there needed to be more Seinfeld despite the fact that more Seinfeld wasn't planned. So it's here we get to Rick Ludwin, who was a vice president at NBC, who took notice of the pleas and demands for more Seinfeld, where he cancelled a Bob Hope TV special, in order to use that special's intended budget to film more Seinfeld episodes. And look, the budget wasn't great, and it only covered four episodes, and Castle Rock weren't too thrilled about the first full season only consisting of four episodes, but the plans went through anyway, making it the smallest order of a sitcom in TV history. The four new episodes made their debut in May and June 1990, almost a year after the pilot was aired, and the show was no longer called The Seinfeld Chronicles, but just Seinfeld. And then a season two followed in 1991, with 12 new episodes. And then from season three onwards, the number count for each season were in their 20s, usually 22 to 24 episodes. And thus, Seinfeld had taken off. So that first season of five episodes is the shortest in the show's history, and kind of a reflection that not many people believed in the show. But the demand came along, and so they had to quickly whip up some episodes together. Number seven, origins of the other characters. So it's here we get to the other three quarters of the quartet of the Seinfeld cast. Wow, try saying that three times when you're drunk. The other characters being George, Kramer, and Elaine, all of whom were based on real people in Seinfeld's and Larry David's real lives. George is actually based on David himself, however he didn't want to actually play the part, opting to just write for the character instead. Seinfeld's initial choice for the part was his real life friend, Jake Johansson, but he turned it down. Several other actors auditioned, including Nathan Lane, Larry Miller, and Brad Hall. Jason Alexander didn't have much faith in his audition, as he felt like he was basically doing a Woody Allen impersonation. But to his surprise, he was cast, as Seinfeld and David thought that he was perfect as George. When it came to the wacky and wired-haired neighbor, Kramer, the character was based on Larry David's neighbor, stand-up comedian, Kenny Kramer. However, it was felt that the connection between Kramer and Kenny Kramer might be a little too obvious, and Seinfeld considered not having the wacky neighbor character at all, until David convinced him otherwise. So to hide the fact that this character is based on a real person called Kramer, the character of Kramer was originally called Kessler in the TV pilot, although in the original script he was called Hoffman. When the series took off, it was decided to call the character Kramer, as the name supposedly intrigued Seinfeld. And so, of course, Kenny Kramer wanted to play Kramer, but this request was denied. Although, Kenny Kramer did seek financial demands and compensation with NBC for the character being based on his own life and image. Once again, there was auditions for Kramer, including Tony Shalhoub and Larry Hankin, but Michael Richards won over his audition, and what probably helped is the fact that he had previously worked with both Seinfeld and David. And finally, there's Seinfeld's ex, Elaine. Well, this is where things get complicated, where I think a new segment is needed. Look, otherwise, number seven is just going to be too damn long. Yada, yada, yada. I mean, I do have other things to do today, so with that... Number six, character changes. 
So as mentioned earlier, in the original pilot episode of Seinfeld, there was no Elaine. Instead, there was a waitress called Claire, played by Lee Garlington. However, when the subsequent series followed, Claire was replaced by Elaine, who was played by Julia Louise Dreyfus. Now, there are several stories surrounding why there was a character switcheroo, and it seems that everyone involved in the show has their own version as to why Claire was out and Elaine was in. The show's producer, Warren Littlefield, claimed that after the pilot was filmed, it was then decided that a waitress wasn't the right occupation when it came to hanging out with Jerry, George and Kramer, and that she'll be too busy pouring coffee to be a part of the group. Jason Alexander claimed that there may have been a character change because actress Lee Garlington had a falling out with Larry David because she rewrote some of her scenes and he didn't like her rewrites. It's also been suggested that Saturday Night Live alumni Julia Louise Dreyfus was added to the cast to add more sex appeal. And even Seinfeld himself got on the case and insisted that the real reason there was a character and actress swap was because they wanted someone, quote, more involved. I can actually remember watching the pilot episode on TV after watching several later seasons, which had already been broadcast, and I couldn't figure out why Elaine and her fun demeanor and fuzzy hair were nowhere to be seen, and I was relieved when she showed up in the next episode. But thankfully Elaine was there from episode 2 onwards. It's been suggested that other actresses considered for the part include Rosie O'Donnell, Megan Mullally, and Amy Yazbek. But Dreyfus made her debut as Elaine in the episode The Stakeout, and she starred in every episode ever since, except for the season 4 two-parter The Trip, due to Dreyfus being in the late stages of pregnancy. All four cast members have amazing chemistry, and just work off each other perfectly. Number 5. No Hugging, No Learning Despite the show being set in New York City, hardly any of Seinfeld was filmed there. Instead, most of the series was filmed in Los Angeles. The pilot episode was filmed at the famous Red Studios on Stage 8. But from there onwards, the show was pretty much filmed on studio sets at CBS Studio Center in the San Fernando Valley. This really actually baffles people, as Seinfeld features several street scenes that look like New York City. Well, that's because the CBS Studio Center already had a New York City street set in its backlot. So, the Seinfeld crew just used that. However, according to Peerspace.com, some scenes were actually filmed in New York City. Namely, the scenes of Jerry doing his stand-up comedy sets to a live audience. These scenes were apparently filmed at a comedy club at West 44th Street. Later into the show's filming, where Seinfeld had reached huge heights of fame and success, Seinfeld and David actually found the memo that was made which featured the test audience's response to the pilot episode, which was basically just trashing the show. The two funny men decided to frame the memo and hang it in a bathroom on the set. I don't know why that delights me so much, but it just does. Throughout the show's filming, co-creator Larry David had a no-hugging, no-learning policy, which was something of a motto for the show. What the no-hugging, no-learning mantra basically means was to avoid giving the characters sentimentality or a chance to change and grow. On the account that underneath the jokes and laughter track, Seinfeld was actually a pretty dark show. David added that some pretty grim stuff actually does happen in Seinfeld, like breakups and people losing their jobs. And so I guess that this no-hugging, no-learning policy keeps the serious issues in check to maintain the show as a sitcom. Because no matter what happens, the characters always have to stay the same. Kramer always has to be bursting through those doors. Number 4. The show pissed off a real-life soup chef. Throughout Seinfeld's 180 episodes, there of course were many classic and memorable moments. Once that got everyone talking, Season 7, Episode 6 was an episode called The Soup Nazi. It's about a new soup canteen that arrives in town, which is run by a very strict, abrasive, and confrontational soup chef called Yev Kazim. And his hectic way of dealing with his customers is where the term Soup Nazi came from. You want bread? Yes, please. Three dollars! <laughs> what? No soup for you! The character of Kazim was played by actor Larry Thomas, and the part actually earned him an Emmy nomination for Best Guest Actor in a Comedy Series. 
Although not everyone was laughing, as the character was based on a real life soup chef who also had a soup restaurant in New York City, who also apparently in real life had the nickname The Soup Nazi. He was so angry and furious with Jerry Seinfeld when being interviewed by CNN, he referred to him as a clown while describing his actions as disgraceful. You're famous because of him. No, he got fame to me. I made them famous. The whole New York can know, everybody know this thing. What is it about your soups that make them so special, famous, and franchisable? That is a proper question from wrong person. Why do you don't ask Zegar? Why do you don't ask the public? Why are you asking me this question? Well, I guess no soup for me. And it doesn't end there. One time, several weeks after the episode was aired, several cast and crew members of Seinfeld visited the soup restaurant, including Jerry Seinfeld himself. And when Al saw Seinfeld, he got stuck into him and screamed out a heap of profanities and expletives, as well as demanding an apology where Jerry would go on to give a very sarcastic apology. And thus, Seinfeld was banned from his restaurant. So needless to say, he didn't take it very well. The show itself went on to be considered a classic among the show's fans, as well as being one of the most talked about. However, from my memory, the episode that got everyone talking was indeed the contest, which leads me to my next point. Number three, the hands-off challenge of writing the contest episode. So it's here we get to the infamous 11th episode of season four, The Contest. The episode that everyone was talking about, where within the episode, Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer decide to, well, have a little bit of a contest, which was actually based on a real contest that Larry David himself took part in. So, what is the actual contest itself? Well, the contest is to see who could go the longest without... You know... Doing something people do in private. You know... Having some... One-on-one -on -one time... Get it? Ugh, look, I'll just get Bob Ross himself to explain what I'm talking about. <laughs> Beat the devil out of it. This was actually a tricky episode for Larry David to write, as the actual words used to describe what the characters can't do was deemed unsuitable for primetime, according to NBC. So to get around this, David referred to the one-on-one -on -one time as master of my domain. And that sentence itself would become a common term used to describe playing with oneself, as well as cement itself in pop culture. And of course, despite the actual terminology not being said, everyone knew what this episode was about, and it became what many claim to be the greatest Seinfeld episode ever. It won a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Writing, and in 2009 it was ranked at number one in the TV Guide's Greatest Episodes of All Time. From my own personal memory, the scene in particular that got everyone raving about the show was when after seeing a naked woman, Kramer disappears only to return a few minutes later saying, I'm out. I swear this I'm out line had everyone in hysterics back in the day. It's a brilliant episode which very cleverly discusses an issue without even saying it. Now that's a talent. I'm out. <laughs> Beat it dry. Number two, music and other bits and pieces to fill out a number two slot. One standout aspect of Seinfeld was the music that was composed for the show, especially its main theme, which had that distinct guitar and mouth pop sounds. You know, the music that sounds like this. The music was composed by musician Jonathan Wolfe, who scored other popular sitcoms, including Married With Children and Will and & Grace, and his infamous guitar strings and mouth pops would introduce each episode. However, the show didn't start with one constant theme. The music at the start for each episode would be a little bit different, depending on what Jerry was talking about in his stand-up open monologue. And when you think about it, that's a lot of episodes, meaning lots of different versions of the Seinfeld theme. Wolf himself called the process labor intensive, but worth it. Throughout the series run, there were several storylines that were abandoned, including Kramer putting together skeletons for a museum display, 
The main character's going on a trip to Mexico, George's father Frank dabbling in medical marijuana, but the one that I find the funniest, the revelation, the soup Nazi is an actual Nazi. <laughs> There is an entire episode that was dropped called The Bet, which explored the topic of buying handguns. Seinfeld said that they did read-throughs of the episode and tried to make it funny, but ultimately, The Bet just wasn't fun, and thus it was dropped in favour of the episode, The Phone Message. Seinfeld has had a lot of guest stars over the years, including, but not limited to, Brian Cranston, Courtney Cox, John Favreau, Terry Hatcher, James Spader, Bob Odenkirk, and Stifler's mom. The show also had some celebrity writers, namely the Farley brothers, who would go on to create Dumb and Dumber and There's Something About Mary, where in 1992 they wrote an episode called The Virgin. Jerry himself actually does have a favourite moment in the entire Seinfeld series, and that's the moment when George pulls out the golf ball during his beached whale story in the Marine Biologist episode. Yep, out of everything that happened in Seinfeld, this was his number one standout moment, apparently. Number one, the end of an era at the hand of Jerry himself. The Seinfeld show was insanely popular during the 90s, and sadly on May 19th, 1998, after nine seasons and 180 episodes, the final episode of Seinfeld was broadcast, making it the end of a chapter in the history of television. The episode was conveniently called The Finale, and was actually a two-part story that brought in 76 million viewers. I remember at the time, no one saw the show's ending coming, and so it hit a raw nerve, and was an unexpected blow that Seinfeld, which at that point had become a household staple, was now no more. I also remember it really made use of the Green Day song, Time of Your Life, and it made the song really popular. I don't know about the US, but here in Australia, the melancholy song was used in all the commercials that were advertising the final episode. And so the emotion of the song really went with the emotion of the show's closer. It's like the show itself is saying that it hoped you had the time of your life. So why did the show come to an end, especially if it was still just as popular than ever? Well, Jerry Seinfeld just felt that it was time to call it quits. Simple as that. I guess he felt the show said everything that needed to be said, and it was just time to stop while the show was still on top. Although the idea of walking away from success, or something successful that clearly works, may seem baffling, I actually really respect the decision. Jerry wanted to end the show while it was perfect, before the show may have started to become stale or lose its flair. I mean, after all, just look at The Simpsons. But no matter what happens, never say that the show was cancelled. Larry King made that mistake, and he had to suffer the wrath and fury of the Seinfeld. Yeah, that was awkward. Yeah. You think I got cancelled? Are you under the impression uh, that I, I got cancelled? I... Nope, the show was perfect, and it was the time to end it as something perfect. But the show still lives on in the hearts of all those who watched it and continue to watch it now, along with the great joy and laughs that it brought with it. To respond to Green Day's song, yes, thanks to Seinfeld, we did have the time of our lives. So despite supposedly being a show about nothing, Seinfeld sure did reach great heights and triumphs. And there really hasn't been anything quite like it since. It really is a relic of its time when something magical came along just at that right time with the right people involved. Anyway, I'm Minty, and No Soup For You is still one of my favourite lines ever. See ya!